You're listening to Cotton Tales Podcast, part of the Silicon Valley Black Project, which produced the documentary film A Place at the Table about the Black pioneers of Silicon Valley. A Place at the Table can be viewed for rent on Vimeo.com on demand backslash a place at the table stem. Through Cotton Tales podcast, the Silicon Valley Black Project will continue to recognize the contributions made by African Americans. We will be featuring African American professionals, technologists in the fields of engineering, administration, and entrepreneurial pursuits from the past and present. Meet Don Brown, a young woman involved in coaching and advocating for those in the mental health community. She works with the Santa Clara County chapter of the National Alliance on Mental Illness. She has also started a nonprofit organization entitled Leaders Tomorrow that provides mental health professionals targeted for people of color. Welcome, Don Brown. Tell us all about you. So I am a mental health advocacy coach okay. and a consultant. What? Yeah. Don Brown <laughs> to this profession. Tell me about who you are. You know, our family grew up in the South. My mom is from Tulum, Louisiana. My dad is from Pine Bluff, Arkansas. And they came out to Milpitas as... Um, when it was first being integrated, so they were one of the first African American families in Milpitas to integrate Milpitas. Their families came with them. So when I grew up, a lot of people lived in our house. My aunts, my grandmother, who was deaf at the time, um, my cousins. So there was just a lot of us that were always in the family. And it was interesting because I think from that experience, I learned about community. And I learned about collaboration and cooperation. And so I think that's kind of where my basis and the genesis of my work is. My mom has always had a, a, a giving servant heart. And so she's always helped people in the community. And my dad was an innovator. He used to run his own company. He was in the military. He was very cerebral. We were always reading books about, like, politics or you know there's always something that he wanted to talk about from an early age that I can remember at the breakfast table we'd be talking about stuff that I was like did you read that book I gave you we were like that was so thick but yes and that would be kind of how we had our conversations um so it kind of was a, a lead into the work that I do now but when I probably about 20 years ago um my um daughter um came to stay with me for the weekend. I got a call from a judge. She was in foster care at the time and asked if I would be willing to bring her um, to my home for the weekend. And we had just, I'd just seen her, like, this was in, like, June. And we were just together in, like, December. And the weekend turned into a week. And I remember reaching out to a social worker, and I was like, hey, I know you're busy because, um, you know, so-and-so is still here. And, uh, and she was like, oh, thank you. You know, if you could just get her in a program. And I was working at Siemens. I was working in their um, marketing department. So I was in corporate communication. So I did marketing and public relations. Mm -hmm. And so I was taking her to work with me. And all the folks at work, they were so wonderful. I had the best department, which I thought was really, she remembers it to this day. Um, but she wasn't always doing so well. And when she came, she had this kind of imaginary friend, which I found to be helpful at the time because I was like, Ooh, I know nothing about parenting. This is helpful. She could play with her little friend, eat with her friend. Um, but as she began to um, get older, she developed a mental illness, which I wasn't aware of. So I'd gone to my pastor and the pastor gave me holy oil and another pastor gave me a book on casting out demons. But after a while, it didn't um, change. And so what I learned through that journey is that many families like me kind of sit in a space where people who have a mental illness in their communities or in their families, mm -hmm. it, it isn't spoken about. And so as I've gotten more educated, and so as I started learning and my daughter through, um, I just was like, let me, you know, let me learn a little bit more. And when she was, Probably in junior high, going into high school, 
she had a significant um, episode. You know, many of us struggle in silence um, because we call it other things. You know, the family's like, she's just trying to get extra attention. Mm-hmm. Ain't nothing wrong with her when she was being released from the hospital. And they directed me to NAMI. And I went to NAMI and I took their family to family class. We were the youngest. Everybody else had kids that were like 54, 49, 38. And she was like 17. So I was like, shoot, I wish they should have gotten in on this a little early. That's what I thought. I was like, this is not going to be our, you know, in 10 years, I can tell you, she will not be a, a gentleman going to see his father who was 88. And I, and I think that's when it clicked for me because they had a similar diagnosis, the staff. And he says, you don't always think that my dad is on the young man's unit. He's an 88 year old man. And I literally standing behind him went, 88? And he turned and looked at me and I thought, in that moment, I thought, wait a minute. She's not going to get past this in three months. So I went back to the class and I said, so she won't outgrow this? So I went to her therapist. I said, so she's not going to outgrow this. I just want to be clear. And they said, generally, no. I said, well, we need to start there. Like, I would have come at this so differently. I I mean, you know, I graduated from UC Berkeley. I wanted it like a white paper. I was like, you know what? I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be cutting edge. I'm going to learn as much as I can. I went to every Stanford had a brain conference. I'm like, I'm going to the brain conference. I'm on every conference. I'm on every, I'm reading every book that I can pertaining to her illness. And I realized there needs to be language and there needs to be language in communities of color. It got me moving. And I said, okay, so I went back to the pastor and he was like, really? <laughs> and I said, okay, first and foremost, maybe I should start educating pastors because that's where we go first. Right. We go there first. You know, I prayed about it and God led me to this point. And so I'll my focus initially was, how do I help people not sit in the same chair I did? And, and I'm an advocate, like I'm a staunch advocate. And, you know, so we were able to secure a lot of resources. We were able to get connected to different programs. I started by advocating, uh, teaching family to family. I wanted to learn as much as I could. And then from there, I started um, training. And I'd always already been training. I used to train at UC Berkeley to train for a large nonprofit organization. So I've been in the training world and space for quite some time. Mm-hmm. So I understood that, like how do you take complicated information and break it down so it's engaging, it's entertaining, um, and it's impactful. And so I wanted to take what I'd learned from that experience and apply it to mental health. And then I really wanted to apply it to our communities, to communities of color, African, ancestry, Latino, Native American, all the ethnicities that really touched our family and then fan out from there. You know, we're also Japanese in our family, Korean. Um, So I wanted to, like, make sure that I was able to educate. So I started with um, educating individuals. I teach youth mental health first aid with the national in partnership with the National Council of Behavioral Health. I do teach at, um, for NAMI at the national level and at the state level. Work with NAMI Santa Clara County, um, leading and teaching as well. And so it just became something that became of interest for me. So that's how I kind of got started in this space. What was your degree in, at Berkeley? What's I actually started in business. Oh. had to take a social class. And the, my social teacher... Tomas Almaguer, that's his name, was so engaging that I switched majors. And so I remember I was applying to the business school and um, I went back and was like, I think I'm going to stay in SOS Um, because it was like the only requirement I needed. That teacher, I don't know where he is now, but he left a profound impact on me. He was passionate about the study of people and women and um, he made it interesting. He made me want to become a sociologist. But your first job was in at Siemens? Siemens wasn't my first job, but um, I worked in the tech world. Siemens was probably like my second or third job. Okay. My first job was also in a tech company. It was around communication. You know, I always kind of landed in roles like guiding, leading, educating um, individuals. In my first role when I was young, this gentleman who sat next to me in this cubicle was in transition. He was a man who had been married for 40 or 50 years who identified as a woman. And I remember the company was trying to find out what bathroom he used. And and he and I became friends. And it was so new to me. I'd never 
experience or knowing anyone that was in the LGBTQ community it wasn't like people are as open and honest as they are, you know, right now, it's, it, especially in, you know, in communities of color. Well, they probably yeah. don't, they didn't feel as safe as they do now. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Through your mm -hmm. life experience. Correct. Because, because yeah. you saw a need in the black community. I saw a need in the black community, yeah. for sure. So, yeah. but then, then we also put in there, did you start with black ministers with this counseling of yours? Ministers in general. Yeah. Ministers in general. Anyone um, who was in the faith community that I had come in contact with, I just started asking questions about how, you know, people like me get connected to resources. And for some pastors, you know, they had, they were kind of, um, innovative in that space. Um, others, you know, were still getting to know about it. And I wanted to just share as much as I could with them. Yeah. It seems like you were bridging um, ancient beliefs versus modern technology in that, you know, when mm. people had mental illnesses, probably in, the, uh, uh, say, 50 to 100 years ago, it was looked at mm. as demons or uh, uh, being possessed. Mm -hmm. That type of thing. So that would be from the ancient beliefs of, uh, based on the religious doctrines. Huh. As we grew, as we began to understand that there was an illness involved, that the brain was literally ill, mm -hmm. um, it was pretty hard for those ministers or those priests or whatever to let go of that power they had in their community that that they could cure these people of these demons you know that's that's a big piece i mean it was it's a, a big piece of money for them revenue and it's also a big piece of uh just respect for, that the community would give them should they by happenstance be in the room when this quote-unquote demon leaves this person you know wow mm. can you imagine what the, what would happen with that church once the word gets out that this minister is a can destroy the demons, my goodness. Mm -hmm. so, so it's probably a great marketing you know, tool. And I don't know if it was necessarily used in that sense. I don't think that they realized that just like dementia, just mm -hmm. like Alzheimer's, our brain, you know, it's a brain disorder. It impacts the brain. And we don't really think about it from that perspective because mental illness, mental health is physical health. Everybody's mental health is on a continuum, period. And it is one in five individuals have a mental health diagnosis. It's one in five regardless. It's classless. You think about how we co, I mean, how we self-medicate. People self-medicate with drugs and alcohol, right? Wine or marijuana here and there. And, and I mean, there's one in eight folks that are living in that space too. You know, you're talking about, you know, 19.7 million people. So there's a lot of individuals who sit in different buckets or different spaces that aren't sure why they're behaving the way they do. And it's really about education because education and courage can really combat stigma. And we do that with people with cancer, right? People has a diagnosis of cancer or even our loved ones who have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's or dementia, we become instant researchers. We, we go after that joint like, right? I mean, we're like, oh, there's just not enough information, right? We start calling people, hi, is this... Uh, Cancer Centers of America. Hi, is this guy's? What is your uh, oncology department? It's like a whole integrated treatment plan. Yeah. But with mental illness, it is not. It's the only where we are asked to go it alone. I've never, you know, in any other illness, you don't do that. But when it comes to mental illness and I get HIPAA laws, I'm hoping that by empowering individuals and families, we can start shifting some perspectives. People just don't have to suffer. You know, we can bring in qualified, brilliant clinicians, um, psychologists, psychiatrists. They're out there. I work with some. They're amazing. Mm -hmm. And we need to get them front and center. We need to throw, you know, push them, lift them on our shoulders and push them over the fence because the world needs to see who they are mm -hmm. because they help all of us. And, you know, um, it's important. Well, you know, with this conversation that we're having about defunding the police, <laughs> defund, you've lost a whole 
plethora of people right there. Yeah. Right? I'm not an expert, so I don't know how else to say it for them, but if they had mm -hmm. just been clear about maybe just reassigning funds, that type of thing, or re redistributing the funds um, might have been mm -hmm. better. But, you know, it doesn't matter. Sure. It, it, no matter what they say right now, it's yeah. going to be a political football. It but is, yeah. There was one police chief that got up and he said something that I, uh, I just totally agree with him. He said, you're asking us to do too much, to go and take care of mental patients. You're asking us to go and take care of uh, domestic abuse cases. That's right. That's right. You're asking us to be psychologists is, and psychiatrists, which we are not trained to be. Amen to that. And what they want to do is to train them to come in and make the peace not necessarily be a counselor. And so mm. uh, so we've asked him to do all these things. We've handed these things back to him because the, the powers that be years back decided that we didn't need an, a mental health infrastructure because mm -hmm. the very thing you were talking about. We didn't mm -hmm. look at it as an illness. We didn't look at it as, as a community um, effort to change. Mm -hmm. My focus is really around education to people who touch people who have a mental illness. So, you know, although I, I've worked and trained with NAMI and spoken on, on behalf of NAMI, and I've worked with NAMI Santa Clara County in their faith net program, educating pastors. Um, I also work, you know, with Kaiser Permanente's National Suicide Learning Collaborative with the city of Milpitas Suicide um, to Hope, their, their suicide prevention task force. So I sit on that. Um, and, and I think one of the things that I'm learning is that clinicians um, around the country are wanting to have a response to the death of George Floyd. They want to be able to improve and inform better outcomes um, because we are no longer as trusting as we were before. And we weren't always as trusting, but we're even less trusting now. And so how that has shown up is that people are less likely to keep their their appointments and the police officers get invited into a conversation that they're just not trained to deal with. So instead of calling a CIT officer and all officers should be crisis intervention trained, they, they always just should, you know, they should be on this kind of crisis intervention team so that they have some type of mental health training um, or seek out mental health training. And, and we should, too, because police officers are not immune. They're still one in five includes police officers. One in five people with a diagnosable mental illness include pastors yeah. and faith leaders and teachers and mothers and firefighters. So somehow we just, you know, as we do with mental illness, we separate it, right? You versus your community. But, you know, people live in community. Firefighters, even if you're in a fire station, that's a community of brothers and sisters that are tasked with one role, right, is to help make us and safe in, in, in the way that you, you do that, putting out fires or responding to crisis in the community or, in, you know, in, in homes. So although it, it, it appears to be an extra burden, it really does help. Um, just create a better living condition for all of us. Because I talk with pastors who also have a mental health challenge, who are struggling with their own mental health challenge, executives, families, individuals, athletes. I mean, it just, it's, well, nobody is immune to it. So I think it, you know, in the scheme of things, sometimes it feels like an extra burden, like, uh, you know, we are not, we're pastors, I mean, we're police officers or pastors. Mm -hmm. We're not psychologists. Um, and, and I think from a perspective of NAMI, we don't want people to be psychologists. We want the psychologists to be psychologists. But I will say that as an individual who understands CPR, I don't call myself a doctor, but I do feel like if somebody is having some challenges, I could at least implement CPR. And I think we have to shift the way we think about mental illness in that same regard. You know, um, as you were speaking about... Um that we, that we should have some tools to work with mental illness, no matter what our position is. I can remember an incident with my husband and I. We were downtown San Francisco waiting to go into a play, and this homeless man began to harass, just generally just harass everyone that passed by. He was, and he was getting a little uh, physical with people, and someone called uh, the police. 
And I think because it was San Francisco, because of where it was located, they sent the right police. You could tell they had had some type of training right. to mm-hmm. handle these mentally ill people who are wandering mm-hmm. up the streets of San Francisco. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, Al and I were taken, by first of all, by surprise, mm-hmm. pleasantly surprised. Mm-hmm. Um, now, he, the man did get try to become physical during the process of them calming him down. He still showed some ability to fight aggression. back and aggression, right? Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. that's when the other two stepped in. They never handcuffed him, but they did mm-hmm. hold him to the point where they could put him in a, a squad car and get him off of the street. But it was done in a humane manner. You could mm-hmm. tell that they understood his issue was not, that he wasn't there, that this man was, the man who he, the man he was, was not there. Absolutely. It was so another I, you know, man, I, I think you know? the challenge that we have now really, you know, is, is a lack of humility, mm. a lack of civility. Yes. Um, and I think a lack of education. You know, it becomes incumbent upon us to educate everyone about us on how to deal with us. But, you know, what's really interesting is we don't see that. I've, I've seen officers, you know, here in Santa Clara County and other places, I've lived in other places, come across individuals who are equally as frustrated, who are not people of color, who get a conversation. Because like attracts like. That's just the way the world is, right? We tend to respond and react to people that we feel are similar to us. In hiring practices, community engagement, there are people who speak to our spirit in ways that we're like, I'm comfortable around that person. I had a doctor, he had undergone a training, and he was surprised that part of the training, if you don't feel safe with somebody that comes into the hospital, then it's okay for you to call security or do all these things. This is how we've been, we're being indoctrinated, even in hospital settings. So if I come in and I'm frustrated, oh my gosh, I have a broken leg and I can sit here and blah, blah, blah. And so I seem a little agitated and you already have an issue with the aggressive or angry black woman or whatever we're deemed um, in the setting. You can come at me in the same way that you think I'm, you know, coming at you or at anyone, Mm -hmm. right? You can call security, you can do all these different things without really just coming civilly and saying, listen, I, I get you've been here for a long time and I'm really sorry. Let's, what seems to be the issue? The level of hate, the level of uh, civil uh, unrest maybe, but the, the level and, and the comfort of people being utterly disrespectful. I've seen grown-ups disrespecting children of different ethnicities. Mm-hmm. I said, in America, in this current culture, in this current society, we have given permission for us to excuse the worst of ourselves in an effort to feed our hunger of anger, feed our hunger of, you know, um, unrest, feed our hunger of frustration. You know, why are you here? Why is this happening? And, and I think that police officers, doctors, people in positions of power, um, educators have been able to get that behavior excused. And, and in not all cases, I mean, some cases people get fired and they, and they should, they get their reprimand. But the fact that people feel that I can behave like this and deal with the consequences later. And we need to get back to the best of who we've been because, you know, we don't do that. Who Who are we to bring the worst. I mean, you know, we're all going to transition out of this life at some point. Mm -hmm. And to leave that as our legacy, the legacy of fear. I created fear in a five-year-old. If we just act and and start and lead with compassion in the work that we do with people who have Alzheimer's or seizure disorder or Tourette's syndrome or mental illness, you know, if officers like in San Francisco decided you know what, I'm going to show up with compassion and empathy first. I know I'm tired. Yeah, and they have problems too, right? They have kids right. as well that may or may not be following the rules. Or Imagine if Steph Curry just decided, you know, I just, I can't even shoot a three-pointer because I just got finished arguing with Aisha. It's just, I just, I need to take a break. We'd be like, what? Get out there and focus. We got to win this game. 
officers are no different, you know, but they just may not have been given the tools to be able to separate my bias from my job. I have a job to protect you. I don't have to like you. You know, I, I work with the Muslim community. Um, and they're like, we don't, you know, we don't get to call the police officers all the time. They don't, they don't really work on our behalf. And, and that's unfortunate, right? Just because you're, you're a Muslim to send you, you know, you're a practicing Muslim that you don't feel safe calling an officer when things are unsafe. That shouldn't be our world. Sometimes we feel we operate in a, in a world like, you know, the worst of the worst can get up and advise us. And we're like, that's a great idea. Until it's not. It's not. That shouldn't be what we're known for, even in our community. So. I, I hate to burst your bubble, but I think most things are cyclical. And they are. And we're going through a cycle. They are. I believe when that, too. I was a young person. Uh, yeah. This was that was the norm when it came to the black community. Mm -hmm. it, they would they had there was no age limit to what to who could right. be insulted or hurt. That's true. Uh, by yeah. the the larger community, the big, the more yeah. the um, yeah. dominant community. So we got Absolutely. we had a a way of reading people at a distance mm -hmm. uh, to know if we were in danger or not. The difference I think then was that we had a uh, strong, cohesive Absolutely. black community. We lived, we lived. And we were prepared because we were prepared. my great aunties would tell me, you don't trust, don't trust these folks. Day I don't one. care what they tell you. Day you one. just, you smile and be kind, but don't you trust them? Don't you dare trust them? But I think we got comfortable, right? We haven't experienced that. My mom's from, I, you know, Toluca, Louisiana. My dad's from you know, Pine Bluff, Arkansas, I have family out in Little Rock. So, you know, when you have folks, you know, going to swimming holes that are like, you know, black only and white only, you know, you, you are already aware. You don't, you know what I'm saying? So you're absolutely right. I think the difference is we've gotten away from sitting at the feet of our elders to get that wisdom and education because that was essential. It was so essential for our upbringing. It was so essential for our survival. Well, I, you think, know, I think we have been slowly trying to create or build that community of, uh, for black Absolutely. people to go Absolutely. to for safety, for advice, for Absolutely. you know direction, and and th that's a good thing because along with the mental health issues are the ideology that we have built around eugenics. And racial superiority and that type of thing. That right. is what's bubbling up to the top now. Because we have leaders that have given people, first they gave them permission to show the side of them that they have been dying to let us know. And that is that, <laughs> you know, they want us to know that uh, they uh, don't want us here. Okay, and we got that. We've known that all along. Thank you very much. Thank but you. now, not yeah. only don't we, do we not want you here, but we we want to hate on you and we want to hurt mm. you because we feel uncomfortable. And we're looking at our leaders and saying, what has happened to you? Do you not understand that if you mm -hmm. say certain things, you're going to trigger all of mm -hmm. this hate that's been here? It's not even a medical term. It is mm -hmm. something that we made up to justify our racism. To prove it, they spent hundreds of millions of dollars very, very wealthy, wealthy people in this country. We're talking about Ford, and we're talking mm -hmm. about Watson, who started mm -hmm. IBM. Um, mm -hmm. We're talking about Roosevelt. We're th talking about mm -hmm. people who we looked up to, believed mm -hmm. that this, there was some validity to this idea of eugenics, that mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. were inferior because of... Right, what right. Racer, yeah. And it's still always going to be that's really an aspect to the human experience. Mm. I just feel like that's just the case. I do believe, though, and I'm hopeful that there are more people who don't believe that that's the way it should be than there are who believe it should be. Like, I think young people don't hang on to race the way that a lot of the older community does. You know, when I talk to college students, they're just so intertwined. Dating interracially, very open with their sexuality. You know, they're just, just developing and, and blossoming into these amazing potential thought leaders that are really 
I think it's incumbent upon us because we're all, you know, we're getting older. It's the young people's time now. Yes. And yes. so we want to kind of leave them with an opportunity to be compassionate and empathetic. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think that there's so many who are interested in getting involved in um, some of the activities and learning. And they speak very openly about their mental health in, in the workforce. I think that companies going forward also need to be able to speak to and have services and programs, EAPs, you know, on um, the employee assistance programs and a list of therapists that um, can, can speak and support their workforce, their, their young people, because young people have a very different approach to work than the elders. These young people, they switch roles so frequently. They're in startups and then they're not, and then they're, you know, they're in roles. And then when they realize this company is not for the higher cause of humanity, is not giving back or equitable or, or, you know, racially sensitive, they're okay saying, you know, thank you and good night. And so I I think oftentimes we have to kind of consider that people are changing Mm -hmm. communities. These young people are the, they're the brightest. I mean, there's some bright stars out there. I also think there's been some beautiful things that have come out of this experience with the pandemic. Number one, we're talking more about mental health where we haven't before. We're talking more about racial equality, you know, inclusion, diversity, and so when you talk about diversity and inclusion and creating a more equitable experience for everyone in your company or everyone in your organization, that's a beautiful thing. And mm-hmm. so these experiences may not be as um, present as they are now. Not that people haven't been fighting for Black Lives Matter and, and diversity, equity, and inclusion. It isn't like these haven't been conversations and buzzwords for a while. I mean, I do DEI training as well. But nowadays, I think, given the current climate, we're more apt to talk about it, and especially mental health. And so I, I'm glad. I think that I agree with you that cycles repeat themselves. What? Mm-hmm. You know, build the tools to be prepared for that change. And how would yeah. we do that now? I think the biggest problem we have right now is that we allowed our mental health infrastructure to be destroyed in the state of California. And then the nation began to copy what we had done uh, with the help of Nixon and his crew. Um, Mm -hmm. They took away, in fact, they literally tore down mental Mm -hmm. health hospitals. So Mm -hmm. even if we had changed our mind halfway through, there was no structure, no building to take them to, so we ended up putting them in, in jails and, and prisons. So that, was, so that is an issue. Yeah, yeah that's that true. And, and I think, too, people who have a mental illness don't always have to be jailed or hospitalized. I think if we become more educated in this country, other countries are doing are ahead of the game, you know, when it comes to this work. But I think that we have an obligation because people who have a mental illness live in community. Yeah. They live in our family. We might be married to them, raising them. Right? right? We might be related to them. We might be in a cubicle right next to them. We might be inviting them to the barbecue. We just don't know that. Right. And so, you know, and I know of an officer, there's a, a, a gentleman that I work with whose officers, whose father's an officer. Um, he's a police officer. And his mom had a, a mental illness. And when his son became ill, he was like, you will not have a mental illness. You're not going to get therapy. You're not going to treatment. You're not doing anything. Um, but he did. The son did it anyway because, you know, it's his health and well-being. And he, 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 it's for him not a stigma because as young people, right, they're not as stigmatized as, no. as, the, as the oldest. Um, and what came of it is that he was speaking. I do a series of town halls around race and mental health because race has been deemed a public health crisis. So I do a series of town halls. I'm doing one on the 31st of August for young African-American women age 17 to 24. But I did um, one for men, young men, 17 to 24, and one for men, 25 up. And he presented. And he did a training to pastors. And he also, this young man, did he trained uh, about 15 to 20 pastors. And then he also spoke on the panel with these, these clinicians for the town hall that I had put together. And his father was so proud of him. And it was a kind of, for him, he said, full circle, because where it's been kind of like 
hush hush his father is now like you know what that's my son he was very proud I mean he joined the call early we're like who is this person <laughs> and um and then he came back on like I'm so-and-so's dad and it was a proud moment for both of them and here's an officer so you know again this goes back to what you're saying in San Francisco here's an officer who has a mother with a mental illness who has a son with a mental illness and yet there's still stigma around mental illness. Mm-hmm. So until there's education, even for people who might feel like, you know, I just can't because it was too painful as a child, or I can't because I am unwilling to do this. Um, people change. He's changed. And so I'm sure now he can offer up wisdom to other officers around how you approach people who have a mental illness. Because he knows about it firsthand. So it's people like that, people with such rich stories who can see individuals who have a mental illness, not as a burden, but as a gift to society, right? They walk with a different vibration. They can touch individuals that we may not be able to inspire, educate, educate, or reach. And so I believe that people who have a mental illness, you know, it. I don't think it's a bad thing. I believe it's a gift. I think everything that we have that allows us to touch different parts of humanity is a blessing yep because the matter well the fact of the matter is we are here and that in itself is a miracle (laughs) so what is your view of the work of health advocates for those that can really um you know, really uh, help improve the quality of of care and treatment. I I think peer advocates are really important. Individuals like myself who are trying to help other families can help, you know, provide entrees and access because we've been down that journey before, but also individuals who have um, an illness, who actually are living managing their illness I think it's very important and you know the county has services you know that support and I think it, it's a model that is is um, kind of expanding across the country this kind of peer advisor model where individuals who are peers they either are family members loving somebody with a mental illness or individuals with a mental illness are part of the conversation it's so vitally important you know I started a, a, a nonprofit for that reason because I really want to make sure that we can get you know voices out in the community and we can help create an environment where we're all working towards you know equitable health care mental health care what's the name of your nonprofit organization Don oh it's leaders of tomorrow and yeah. so the focus yeah. of leaders of tomorrow is Again, mental health advocacy, coaching, um, mental health education. Um, that's that's really our vibe. We do training. We do speaking panels, town halls. Mm-hmm. We also help families through coaching, helping them to navigate the mental health experience um, and connect them to um, clinicians, connect them to individuals that can help guide their wellness and their treatment. So we believe in kind of an integrated treatment model. What's the difference between mental health and mental wellness, or is there really a difference? Mental health is kind of how we engage in community, how we make choices, make decisions every day, um, how we handle stress, how we navigate challenges, how we get through difficult times. That impacts our mental health for everyone. We all have it. It's, it's how we approach our day every single day. Okay. Mental wellness is what are things that we are doing specifically intentionally to improve our mental health. So mental well-being is that approach to our mental wellness. And that includes mindfulness. It includes gratitude. Um, getting good sleep, eating good food, exercise, um, talk therapy for some. It includes being intentional about how you create your community because we have we have say in how we create our community it includes our spiritual practices whichever those may be and how that guides us that is is definitely part of of how we guide our our groups and how we kind of lead all of us have mental health we all have mental health yeah we, have we all have mental health and how you we all don't have mental illness but we all have mental health because you know, mental health is it's a part of how we think 
um, act and respond to, to life situations. You know, when we think of our health, it's like physical, mental, emotional, psychological, and social well-being. It's like mm-hmm. what, you know, desire to move forward towards a more fulfilling experience, mm-hmm. right? Um, well-being is like being comfortable, healthy, and happy. I think sometimes when we think about mental health, you know, we don't think that it, it impacts our emotional, psychological, and social well-being, but it really does impact how we think, feel, and act. It, it kind of helps determine how we kind of handle stress or relate to others. And so when I think about mental well-being, it really is the ability for all of us to act in ways that enhance our ability to enjoy life and deal with the challenges that we face. And right now it's even more so than it has been before. But it, it's kind of a positive sense of like emotional and spiritual well-being. And it, it includes like culture and equity and social justice, interconnectedness, you know, our dignity, like how do we feel we're treated. And so that's kind of what when we think about mental well-being is, is what comes to mind. And then, you know, the mental, when you think about mental illness, it's a brain condition and it affects our thinking, feeling, and moods. It's impacted by genetics, environment, and lifestyle. So, you know, it isn't any different than heart disease. It, you know, it's just like any kind of chronic condition. It has behavioral and biological components. So, you know, there are different linking causes to mental illness, and, and it, they include, you know, depression or anxiety, which more people have now, mm-hmm. right? With change, you know, people have more anxiety because we don't have an end date to COVID. We can't see our families. We're more isolated. Depression is starting to become an issue, right? We become, you know, some of us catastrophize. Others of us, you know, um, are just struggling to get up and get to the sink and brush our teeth. So think about the collective experience in humanity. It's part of how we move through this journey. And just being aware, like what are signs and symptoms? How do I know when I'm not doing well? Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't think we think necessarily about that so much. More than ever, we're just really in a very new experience. Some individuals are taking it as as an opportunity to really address things that maybe they haven't addressed about themselves in the past. People learning new tasks and languages. They're trying to like become more spiritually attuned and aware. People are really kind of joining in and trying to focus. And I think for us at at NAMI, our fo- you know, we try to educate our, our focus is education. And at leaders You know, our focus is just to eliminate the barriers that prevent availability and access to quality mental health services to everybody. That's our focus at at LOT. And we want everybody who comes um, in touch with our organization to feel valued, respected, and heard. And so that's what we do. Our focus, you know, our mission is just to provide quality education and support and advocacy coaching to, you know, individuals and communities. This yeah. is your your uh, nonprofit organization. That's what leaders does, yeah. Because we just, we we want to be able to, to, to help folks who are dealing with isolation, stigma, and crisis that associated with mental illness. So, you know, we want to improve communication, collaboration. We want to, you know, help um, impact and, and maybe balance out some of the health disparities, um, in communities locally, in communities of color, mm-hmm. and in communities outside of of, uh, of the U.S. If someone yeah. hearing this podcast wanted to wanted your services, how would mm-hmm. they go about uh, getting in touch they with email you? Email me specifically at um, d brown at leaders org, or they could um, email admin at leaderstomorrow.org. Okay. So either D Brown at Leaders Tomorrow or admin at Leaders Tomorrow. So before we used to do just mental health advocacy coaching and training. So we just are in these two buckets. But now we're doing um, these town halls and cohorts. So we have partnered with Black Campus Ministries um, and NAMI and um, other universities around the country to provide these town halls for young people of color to talk about um, different issues of impacting their mental health in that particular community. 
And following those town halls, our agency is paying for six weeks free supported wellness cohorts. And so it's six weeks of a wellness cohort with a clinical, um, it's not a, it's not therapy, but with somebody that is skilled in, um, in this space, um, usually one of the panelists. And so we're paying for that so that young people can get connected to services. Well, now you, you've been saying this word NAMI. Is that a, a uh, yes, acronym so for it? It is. National Alliance on Mental Illness. So I work with the Santa Clara chapter. I am one of the team leads on an innovation grant to provide education for pastors in Santa Clara County. And so our um, leaders works with um, pastors outside of the county. Um, Mm -hmm. So your first degree was, was it a technical degree? Did you then go and get an advanced degree in sociology? Or I, I did not, actually. I just, nope, I got a degree in sociology from Cal. And um, and I am working um, now to, you know, I'll probably go back to graduate school yeah. in this space. But, yeah, nope, I've just spent the past... 20 years in the mental health space, just navigating and learning. Yeah. Let me and tell you about it. Uh, Don Brown, mental health, advocacy, mental health, health, health advocacy, advocacy coach. Thank yeah. you so much for your time today. I appreciate it. Your conversation was enlightening. I'm hoping that people hear this and understand that mental health is something that we all should be striving for. Mental wellness are the things we do to keep that mental health. By the way, there was a young basketball player on TV this morning who stepped out. He wasn't doing well at the beginning of the game. He couldn't figure out why. And what he, okay. It turns out that he needed the crowd in the stadium. He was yeah. missing all of that. Yeah. He was having a terrible time at playing the game yeah. he loved. So he yeah. he says on national TV, I went and got help. I Good talked to him. I talked to this team psychiatrist, and we Good have worked it out. I've worked it out, and I'm better. That's perfect, wasn't it? And this is a young African American man. Oh, if you get his name, I want to reach out to him. I know. I I, I wish I could. I'll, I'll, I'll try to get it. That, that's what we need. Is we need people. To say, and, and if you know of any companies that are help, that are willing to donate, we're a five hundred one c three, and our focus right now is to get young people connected to mental health services as much as we can. And so we're in the process of writing grants. But if you know folks, a lot of churches we've probably raised right now almost three thousand dollars from churches who have been giving us resources for our town hall cohorts. The town hall themselves, we don't pay any of the clinicians, but we do pay them for their time for six weeks um, with the young people or the men or women, mm -hmm. because a lot of folks right now want just African American clinicians or they want, especially the young people. And so there are people who are um, very much involved with making sure now, especially young people, that their clinicians reflect their identity okay. and ethnicity so yeah if you know of companies that that you come across that you know or individuals that are willing to donate to that um we want to make this a national thing where people can call in and it's usually a cohort of three to five people we try to keep it um small for the uh -huh. sake of support and we're growing our list as well of, of clinicians we have about 10 african-american clinicians and psychologists that are doing this work with us and so um, men five men and five women Fabulous. yeah it is really we're, we're blessed and we get referrals every day that we vet and see if we can get them on board but yeah so our, right now we're doing a fundraising push and so if you know any, any companies or individuals please okay. uh, connect us yeah thank you again for your time i really really appreciate it thank you you're very welcome all right sister Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, Don, for your informative talk on mental health and mental wellness services, in particular for our young people that are seeking clinical help from someone that looks like them. And thank you 
for listening.